Welcome to Champagne Chats, discussions from the green room where we talk all things about the events industry. I'm Kate Woolley, also known as DJ Wildflower, and it's great to be joining you. Coming up, we have the wildly talented Marcia Mendez joining us. Let's get started. Today on the show, I am so excited to have a very special guest and friend. He is a wildly talented musician. He plays sax, percussion, sings, guitar. There's probably more on the list that I don't have. Has had people filling dance floors from Brazil, Europe, Australia, and he's here for us today. Thank you so much, Marcia, for joining me. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me. <laughs> Appreciate it. You're very welcome. When I met you, I knew you as a saxophonist and then realized you're a percussionist and then found out you were a vocalist and then found out that you were a singer and then found out that you also, obviously, originally being from Brazil, would be able to sing in multiple languages. So it's a very difficult thing to put your talents into a box. When someone comes up to you, how do you, how do you um, describe yourself as a musician? It's funny because um, usually I say that I'm not a musician. I'm an entertainer. You are. That is true. <laughs> because the thing is, I um, I, I never it. went to school. I never learned anything at school. Actually, I I left school when I was 12 because I, I come from a really poor family. I told you this story before. You in, did. In, 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 but so I come from a really poor family, and then I have to help my mother to go through the situations, it was really hard growing up in Brazil. And and then in some moment of my life, I have I had to to learn different instruments to get to make some money. And then I, I remember so uh, I start as a percussionist, Brazilian percussionist. And then I start to learn a little bit guitar. And then I was interested in other instruments and then I Always, I was borrowing some friends' instruments to learn, yeah. and then I was like, "Oh, that band needs a bass player." So oh. I was learning a little okay, bit. Okay, so of you're bass. like, "I'll learn that." <laughs> yeah. So, and it was pretty much like that. So, and then even with the saxophone, the saxophone is one of the craziest, craziest stories because not many people believe me because. Uh, Back in the days, my, my fee was about 70 reais. We call reais in Brazil. is about $30. Yeah. And, and to play percussion or any instrument. But for someone that could play horns, was like a double or even more, much more. And then one guy told me that. And then... I had opportunity. It's a long story, but I had opportunity to get one saxophone on a Sunday, and I had another gig on the next Sunday. So I had seven days to learn three songs, and I did it. Believe it or not, and I learned. I played three these three songs in one week, and then I got in love with the saxophone, and but. I learn everything by ear. I can't read music. I'm still so. So I say to my friends that I, I'm not a real sax player or guitarist or singer or percussionist. I I, I like to do a little bit of everything, yeah. but I know I can't do something to entertain you. You can. <laughs> so I can vouch for that. <laughs> that's it. It's an extraordinary talent. Yeah. So, uh, and this is part of the reason why I desperately wanted you to come on to Champagne Chats because we we had a gig in Broome. Um, we were sitting at Cable Beach Club, and you shared your story, and I I was very um, appreciative of you of you sharing the story because I would obviously hung out a number of times, but I didn't really understand the background and the extent of just what you've done in your life. So you left school when you were twelve, no formal education, and then no formal music education, and yet you are truly one of the most talented musicians I've ever met. Oh, thank you. And when I spoke to you about that, you said you also have come from an environment with so many untalented musicians, sports people, because you just, you learnt amongst yourself and you you practised your your skill and you, you worked with other people and you sort of passed on the talent. So there wasn't this formal school, 
but it's almost like you had an informal environment, like a, a like a, a fed on education of people that you're learning from. You know, you know, it's funny because uh, back in the days, probably remember the Brazilian, the Brazilian people was well known as uh, the best soccer players. Yes. Oh, some blah, 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 blah. But now it's changing. And I see the reason that it's changed is because we lost our, um, our sense, our, the way that we used to do, because mm -hmm. we used to learn things on street because we, it was the only thing we could, we, we could do it. Yes. We go to the streets, play with rocks, play off, or we get like a, um, socks yeah. putting together with a paper. We used to do our soccer balls in a way that we, we didn't have conditions to buy a proper soccer ball. Mm. So we we used to play with things that we had, yes. like instruments. Yes. Like we used to get like a can, so and we used to play with those things. So and the skills would come differently. They would. And now I'm feeling that everything is like, a, oh, there's, you have to go to soccer school. Yeah. Now you have to go to this. It's, it's changing. Yes. You're losing that ability to improvise. That's it. And learn from other people. And also there is something for, the bit, for that to be said, and I feel terrible, I've forgotten the name of the book, an author who wrote about the 10,000 hours that it takes to be a specialist in any environment. So 10,000 hours to be a professional photographer, 10,000 yeah. hours to be a musician. And I really believe that comes down to any applying that. So 10,000 hours on the streets, kicking around a soccer ball or butting around um, some sort of instrument. So you're actually getting a chance to, to learn by doing and by doing and by doing and by sharing and being in those environments. I feel from Brazil, I've never been there. I have a number of Brazilian friends that there is a, a, a cultural, there's a depth of appreciation of music at the, at the heart of what makes you to be a Brazilian person and that's my sense of it is that would that be a true statement of like for you learning about music in brazil um from your colleagues from your friends from your family is um, music important in your family yes like uh, any family in brazil i i come from uh, i used to live in favelas you say the ghetto mm -hmm. it's funny because every single house in the favelas either people are kids or Anyone is listening to really loud music, <laughs> really loud music, or they are playing soccer. Mm. Back in the days, it was like this, and my my it's in my family was a bit different, funny the way they used to listen music. My father always my father comes a uh, white family background. Mm -hmm. My mom is is Indian and black. And and then my father always liked samba, samba, and 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 everything related to mm. samba. Things that are, it's kind of this more black people enjoy much more than white people. Yeah, my father was like that because his background. Yes, he grew up with a, a black family around him. Yes, he loved. My mom loved everything, but my mom used to work as a. Um, cleaner or in people's rich people's family's house and and i remember one day i was maybe 10 years old my mom got home with this box full of vinyls like big ones and it was only classic music oh beautiful and my mom was fascinating with classic music because she used to clean this lady's house and was the lady just getting rid of the album? She didn't That's want it. them anymore? Yeah, she was throwing away. She said, no, take this. It was for my ex-husband, something like uh -huh. that. My mom, no, I take it. Yes. And then I remember my, my mom was listening to that those albums every day. So you grew up with classical music as well. As I was samba. listening only Mozart, Beethoven, <laughs> I, uh, all of those guys, Chopin, um, I don't even know how you guys call yes, because I know in Portuguese. Much yeah. <laughs> and 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 I grew up listening to that. Isn't that brilliant? All the thing. And sometimes listen to my father's songs, oh. like a classic Brazilian choro. It's uh, the Brazilian it's samba, bossa nova. Some uh, 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 everything re relates to Brazilian music. Yes. 
So I grew up with that. So and, and it's a bit different to other people because it's, it was more samba, 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 or you know, which is part of that. But you've also got that classical influence. So that's it. From a very very early age, that's it. You were training your ear. So even if you were not preparing to to write a concerto, you still have the ability to pick apart different music. It probably has some influences to exactly. how you could pick up a sax and then seven days later have learnt three songs from never having played a saxophone before. It, it's funny because I remember as a kid, I have this memory. Yeah. Like I, I was like, a, singing that thing because I was listening so much. Like, I was, that was my, my way to play. Yes. I was playing something. But at the same time, I was playing, singing those songs. You could have it in your ear. Yeah. Do you picture the music visually or is there a sense of it being colour? How do you actually, if you don't read the music, I can't read music either, but if you don't read the music, how can you find the information? I don't know. Just appears? Just, it's, it's something weird. Like now, those days, is much, is, is a, is different. But I remember when I was in my 20s, was something now I see as a surreal because I remember like that week that was with the saxophone, I was, or any instrument, I, was, I listened to something and then my fingers was automatic going to the right place. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. It's weird. I remember first time I got the saxophone and I'm going to try to make this short and it's a weird Story, but it's a brilliant story, the, and I really appreciate you resharing it yeah. because this is one of the ones that really stood out in my mind is that, uh, your process of learning how to play an instrument you've yeah. never touched before. Okay, I, my friend, uh, I used to live in a favelas. Yes, favelas is back in the days, it was a really dangerous place. Yeah. All the, 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 the criminals mm. used to live there with people that didn't have money, so it was the two worlds. Drug dealers, uh, bad people, and really good people. Same time, same environment. Mm. And this guy that is a friend of mine, he we used to play together. He said, "Marcio, you know my friend Pernia. Pernia, it's I mean little leg was his nickname. He he got a one really nice harmonica made. He." He stole a car yesterday with a harmonic inside. And I said, oh, okay, man. Anyway. And then suddenly this guy appears in front of us. And he said, oh, Pernia, show my, my I was, he was my brother-in-law. Show my brother-in-law your harmonica. And the guy came because he knew I loved any instrument. Yes. So anything. And this guy came got this saxophone out of his car. Ooh. And then I said, it's not a harmonica, it's a saxophone. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter, same thing. And, and then I knew that was stolen. And I tell you, because my mom and my father was, they didn't have money, mm. but they are like, like real honest people. Mm. It's not yours, it's not yours. This and that. Anyway, he, he said, you wanna buy it? I said, ah, oh, man, I don't have money. And inside I was like, oh my gosh. And then I don't know what happened, but that moment I said, look, I give you $100, 100 reais. And I knew that was much more than 100 reais. He said, nah, give me 150. And I said, no, I have a, I give you 50 now, now and I give 50 next month. He gave him the thing because he was a good friend of my brother in law. And then I got the saxophone. I swear to you, first thing I thought is I'm gonna find the guy, the owner, and I'm gonna ask him, I'm gonna say to him what happened, and I'm gonna ask him for my hundred eyes, I give the, the, the sax back. I think it's fair. That's what I thought. So that was on a Sunday. I learned the day before that the band that I used to play, they were needing a sax player, but I tried to call a friend of mine that was a sax player and I explained to him, say, look, those guys are looking for a sax player for next Sunday. And mate, they have $150, you won't believe it. He said, what, 150? 
I'm not even going to get up off my bed for 150. I said, what? Yeah, man. He's like, minimum is 300. And I was, what? You get $300 to play saxophone? I said, wow, that was on a Saturday. And then suddenly, this thing happened on Sunday. And then I thought, wow. Anyway, I went home that Sunday. I had a gig uh, far away from my city. We came back nighttime. I was with that thing in my mind. I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to this shop near my place. It wasn't near my place, but I knew it's a music shop only sell yeah. um, uh, saxophone, trumpet. So, And then I thought, I'm going to talk to them and explain what, what's going on and, and see what they say about it. Anyway, next day, first thing in the morning, Monday morning, I went there. Uh, this guy was opening the shop. And then I, I, I told this guy this story, everything, the real story. Yeah. And then I said, look, that's the number of my neighbor. I didn't have phone or nothing. If someone comes here and say, look, they stole my saxophone, blah, blah, blah. Right. That's my number. Just say this. Yeah. I'm happy to give back. I just want my hundred dollars, hundred reais back. Yeah. And the guy said, oh, no, fair enough, man, thanks. And then I said to him, mate, can you show me how to hold this instrument? And then he was explained me, he, he explained about the instrument, was a student instrument. He said, it's not a really expensive one. It's like only 1500 I said, wow, yeah. it's not expensive. Yeah. But anyway, he told him how to hold it. I said, oh, cool. And then... uh and then when I was leaving the shop, he said, hey, come back here. So, yeah. And he got a book. He said, take this book. I'm going to give to you. I said, oh, really? He said, no, yeah. And l learn how to play, man. You, I think you deserve. Because he was, he was happening the way that I said to him. Yeah. I was really happy. He showed me how to hold. And then I was reading this book from the shop until my house. And when I got home, I swear to you, I put the, the mouthpiece, I put it in the way that he said, I put it in my mouth for the first time, and then came the sound like a phone. I said, wow, phone. And then I felt something, and my finger, my finger went phone, 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 phone. You know that song, Brazil, la, yes. da, da, da. Yeah, yeah. I started to play that song. But really bad sound. Yeah. Wasn't really nice sound. It was like fum, 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 fum. But I felt and I was almost playing like half of the song, not half of the song, but I couldn't feel that it was going my fingers. And then I was, wow. And then I said, maybe I can play that gig. Yeah. Crazy. Anyway, from Monday to Thursday. I was playing for 12 hours every day. Yep. My mouth here was bleeding, <laughs> was every day. Like, you're taking pa, pa, pa. the opportunity. You, you presented with this opportunity. You're not going to let it go. You no. Are... And then I went to my friends and said to them, look, I think I found a, a sax player for you guys. Oh, really? Because they gave up. No one wanted to play. It's And it wasn't a famous band. It was a... Just a small band. A small band yeah. from the, 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 the our suburb. Yeah. But everything in Brazil, we talk like, here we talk like 400 people. In Brazil, everything's 10 times bigger. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> and so then, your first gig is already to like hundreds and hundreds of people. Yeah. Because I, but my first gig, I remember my first gig was in a, this um, pub in Brazil. Like maybe 300 people, a huge pub. Yeah. Like a, anyway. And Having never played, only just learnt the week before, playing in front of hundreds of people. Yeah. yeah. For the, and then Thursday, I was learning how to play those songs by ear. We're talking about a time that didn't have YouTube, yeah. didn't have nothing, nothing. It was everything. And even we had to record things on the tape. Like, yes. uh, you know, I had, <laughs> yeah. I had to wait for the radio, play the song. Say, oh, and then go. press record. And then you get the song and then you, you learn. And then I learned that it was two songs plus one that is day song. You just need to do something. 
improvise. Mm -hmm. And I ended up doing that gig. The guys, when they saw me with the saxophone on Sunday, and we never had a rehearsal or nothing, they said, I didn't know you play saxophone. I said, yeah, yeah don't worry. And then I remember my brother was like, man, I can't believe you're going to do that. <laughs> and he was there with me. And then when we started to play, uh, the guy that was doing the sound engineer, he put this reverb in the saxophone. Right. Yeah. And, and then I started to play first. Ba -da, ba -da. I, re I saw my brother. My brother had tears in his oh. eye. And then I was, whoa. And everyone in the band was, yeah. Crazy! It's like it's it's a yeah. like magical spiritual something greater than you that was supporting this was, opportunity. It's something that I can't, I can't explain. I don't know if this is probably of course someone can do, but it was something really special. And then I remember that it is, yeah, really and it's cool. an extraordinary story. Yeah. And I just I'll never get sick of hearing it because yeah. these are the magical moments where people that I've met go through that traditional format of going to a music school or music teacher and those sort of lessons. It's always interesting when you meet someone that is, is self-taught um, and you have that year and I don't know if it's perfect pitch, but when I hear you play and I watch you do that and you're listening to a song and you can just hear it in a certain range, it to me it seems like magic because it just comes out of nowhere, but it's just, it's a practice, it's a curation, it's years and years of listening to the music and feeling the music, but then another layer of magic to be able to perform. You know, it's funny because like uh, I I hate rehearsals. Mm. And the guy that- not a very, uh, you like a spontaneous I love <laughs> it. moment. It's something that I always been like that. And for example, our last gig was Sunday. I played with Mark Turner, and yeah. our friend, our amazing sax player. Like uh, I feel really lucky. Actually, I was talking to this friend today and I said to him that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm totally sure that I'm never going to win a lottery because I've been blessed so much in my life, so much. I won the lottery so many times, uh, so many times in a different ways. What a beautiful analogy. Seriously. Yeah. Like a, from, my, from the guy that took me from the streets with my family, that we live in the streets, to the opportunity that I had to come to Australia and everything that I want and the, the kids that my, my ex-wife gave to me and everything, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not, not even joking or giving too much. No, oh, so, no, no, I know. I'm so, if I win the lottery, I can tell you. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. It's because I play in the lottery, by the way. <laughs> if one day I tell you, oh, anyway. But what I'm saying is uh, those guys, Mark, oh, uh, we, we played, and the bands I'm playing with, they said, how are we going to play all those songs without rehearsal? I don't like to call rehearsal. I like to call, let's catch up, talk about songs, say, let's start like this. In the middle, you do that. And it, because I'm surround people that know what they are doing, mm -hmm. then I know I know that you're uh, you're capable to do that. So I know you're not someone that I'm gonna be like, oh my gosh. Yes. And if I feel that you like doing, oh my gosh, I'm gonna do something to save you. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I know. So, so you like working in those environments where you're improvising with people. I was lucky enough to support. You gave me an opportunity to uh, DJ a support sl slot, which is for anyone who is not sure why uh, an Australian DJ would be supporting a Brazilian festival. I, I shared with you my personal love of classic, um, probably 60s, 70s era Brazilian soul. Genuinely fell in love, particularly around COVID. And I shared my love of the music. And so I got to play a set. And then it meant I got to be nice and close to the stage and watch this all like stage is here, I'm here. I, I have finished DJing hours ago and I, I did not move because I wanted to be close to the musicians. I wanted to see you perform. And when you say, I'm not a musician, I'm an entertainer, you are an entertainer. Like you had the crowd just like in the palm of your hands. And there's so much more to being a musician than playing the right notes, 
right? It's about connecting to the audience, feeling, and it's like jazz musicians, I guess, like it's not about hitting all the right notes at the right time. It's about sounding everyone out, give everyone else their space. And it was remarkable to me because I'd, there were so many musicians on the stage. I don't know how many you had at the Brazilian festival, but you had many musicians yeah. and at no point did it feel messy. It felt very much like everyone had their moment. People shined, people pulled back, other people jumped ahead. I know for a fact that the rehearsals were quite limited, but that's not what, that's not what was seen. Like, it, and that to me felt like magic, like it just kind of came together. But you make sure you get the right people. So that's it. And you get the right people and then they you know, have the right mentality and then you trust each other. You go, you you have a break. I've got your back. If you forget something or you miss something, you're going to support each other. So I was lucky enough to 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 learn a few things from different musicians. I, I had the opportunity to play with amazing, amazing musicians around the world. Like I, I lived in Paris. I played with amazing musicians and listen to amazing musicians and like a, and I, I like to to listen to their story or for example Miles Davis once Herbie Hancock he used to play with Miles Davis I don't know if I it's that's the right way to say it about this but he said once he was playing with uh, Miles and then they are playing this thing and then suddenly he played this totally wrong note and he playing, and then he said oh my gosh and then Miles Davis instead looked at him he picked it up straight away in the did something yeah he followed him he wasn't pissed off he didn't do, and then after the show he said oh man sorry no nah, there's no such a thing a uh, era something like that yes and I see like that yeah one thing for example I'm gonna play your song, this beautiful song you created, but you created already. Okay, I will play your song, but if I do something a little bit different yeah. or something is not exactly like that. Put your flair. It's okay. Yes. There's nothing it's wrong with that. It's your interpretation. That's it. Yeah. And that's the way that I see. It seems like the world has had so many adventures installed for you. Do you have any plans specifically of how you want the next few years to unfold or are you just open to what the universe will provide for you? Definitely I'm open. I love it. Yeah. I love this way. Yeah. But I have my pride and joy, something yes. like that. Yeah. I have this show. Yeah. That That's my dream to do properly. I've done that in 2017 for Fringe Festival and, 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 my dreams to do again, but properly. properly. Do in an amazing well. It's a Michael Jackson show, but it's nothing about Michael Jackson. It's a Brazilian show telling Brazilian stories through Michael Jackson sh songs. So it's really cool because I I, 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 I showed the Brazilian samba, mm. the Brazilian capoeira, the Brazilian indigenous, the Brazilian... Everything Brazil, yeah. but with Michael Jackson songs. So that's one of my dreams. And then I have another one that's a, a Brazilian Aboriginal story. Mm. Because, you know, I play in Aboriginal band here. You do. I've, I have my Aboriginal family here that I love them so much. They import Headland. I want to do this story as well, but everything with music. So basically this Aboriginal boy goes to Brazil and this Brazilian boy stays here oh, wow. and they learn the culture uh, and they, they exchange the culture mm. after this is a story. So that's one thing that I want to, it's beautiful. I want to do. So one you, day. you yourself have such an interesting story, but you have interest in sharing other people's very interesting stories. And music is such an incredible medium to share that and compelling. It makes you want to listen. And I really appreciate your time today. It's been really, really special. I really appreciate Invite and to be here. Thank yes, you very much. Yes, you. It's been Thank an absolute you. pleasure Thank having you here today. Thank you for it. joining me on Champagne Chats. Thank you. Um, that brings us to the end of our episode of Champagne Chats with Marcio Mendes. If you enjoyed it, please make sure you do the usual subscribe, tick, all the things or not. This is just an opportunity for me to share our stories and chat with my mates in the events industry. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And remember, may the only pain in your life be champagne. Cheers. <laughs>